Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Fictional Languages in Game of Thrones and Beyond. My name is Sarah Speltz, and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office. Today's webinar is sponsored by the BU Alumni Association and is offered as part of our alumni educational programming. Many of our educational programs are held on campus or in New England, but we offer webinars because we want to connect with our alumni around the globe. And we do have alumni joining us today from California on the West Coast and from states across the East Coast, including Florida, Virginia, Pennsylvania, DC, Ohio, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, and of course, Massachusetts. I'm sure I've missed a few states, but thank you all for joining us. Before I introduce today's speaker, a few notes. This webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect plat meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of this presentation, please contact Adobe Connect at 1-800-422-3623. That number is on your screen there. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available on the BU Alumni Association website, which is bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is eager to answer your questions. You are welcome to submit them in the box that you see below the slides. Um, if you've done a webinar with us in the past, you may know that that's usually a Q&A box and you can only see the questions that you type. Uh, we'll be using it a little bit more like a blackboard today, so um, anything you type in there will be visible to everybody. Um, so we may just wait and, and do the questions at the end, but um, that is available to you. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Presenting from the BU campus in Boston is Professor Alexander Sasha Nikolaev. I'm just going to change these slides here. Uh, Sasha is an assistant professor of classical studies in the College of Arts and Sciences. He was born in St. Petersburg, Russia, and developed an early interest in ancient languages, taking both Greek and Latin in high school. Then, a course in Indo-European linguistics in college made him interested in studying classical philology, historical linguistics, and comparative mythology. He earned his PhD at Harvard and is now a classicist and a linguist, and he is most interested in where language and literature meet across a number of disciplines that engage with the study of the past. Sasha, thanks so much for being with us today. We're very excited to hear more about fictional languages in particular. The floor is yours. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, and uh, thanks for this introduction. I'm excited to have all of you here uh, today as my audience. Uh, if uh, anything I say is unclear, please feel free to uh, to use the question box to submit your questions. And uh, you know, without further ado, let me bring up uh, the map of the world of the Sag of Ice and Fire. So I think this is a map that was uh, created by uh, the fans. This is as much as we uh, uh, currently know about the world uh, of George Martin. And uh, I am, uh, as Sarah said, uh, I'm a classicist and a linguist. I'm obviously not a uh, professor of Game of Thrones or a student of uh, George Martin's uh, work, but I'm fascinated by the books, uh, fascinated by the show, and uh, it's very, it's been very interesting for me to see uh, and try to detect what kind of uh, inspiration did uh, Martin and then the creators of the show uh, use uh, uh, in their work. So, of course, um, um, this world is not the only fictional world that has ever been invented. Here on the slides you can see a, a map of Middle-earth, the uh, wonderful creation of Tolkien. I'm going to say a few words about him today. And you see another map of the uh, disc world. Uh, but our question for today is, how does one go about uh, creating a fictional world and, in particular, uh, creating uh, a fictional language or fictional languages uh, to uh, be used in this uh, fictional universe? Uh, so here's the map uh, of, the, of uh, Martin's world again. Of course, Westeros is the continent uh, on the left. Uh, the one we know best. Uh, some of this map, of course, is more or less conjectural. Like I said, it's produced by the fans. Um, so uh, the first question, uh, what 
real history may George Martin have had in mind as he was creating the world of the Son of Ice and Fire? Well, let's uh, revisit the history of Westeros, uh, and I'm sure things I'm going to say now are going to be familiar to all of you. Nonetheless, let's rehearse. Uh, what we know now, after seven seasons of the show, is that uh, the oldest indigenous population of uh, this continent are the children of the forest. And then uh, around uh, 12,000 years before Aegon's Landing, that's what the BEL stands for, the previous era in that universe, uh, uh, that was when first man arrived uh, to Westeros uh, using the Arm of Dorn uh, that still provided a, a piece of land for them to cross the sea. Uh, which is, of course, the same idea as the uh, uh, Bering Strait uh, uh, that was used by, by the mankind to actually cross over into Americas and populate these two continents. What happens next? We have an Andal invasion around 6000 BEL. Uh, we have Roiner invasion when Queen Nymeria arrives to Dorne. Then uh, Valyria goes down in flames. Uh, and Aegon uh, Targaryen uh, lands in Westeros and the new era of Targaryen begins. Now let's look around you know, the real history and uh, we'll see immediately that the history of England, of British Isles, uh, must have provided all of the uh, inspiration contact points for Martin. So uh, here's a map on the slide for you. Uh, what do we know about British Isles? Well, we know that uh, these settlements have been there since Stone Age, uh, since around 4000 BCE, before Common Era, and uh, the earliest indigenous population of British Isles must have been the mysterious Picts. We don't know too much of them. Uh, there's archaeological sites. Uh, we, uh, we know almost nothing uh, by way of language. Uh, you know, their names are preserved in various legends. Uh, what happens next? Uh, a totally different uh, group of population arrives to British Isles around 500 BCE, and these are speakers of Celtic languages. So, uh, uh, in particular, Brythonic uh, or Britonic, they call themselves Britons, and uh, Goidelic or Gallic uh, languages. So, uh, modern Welsh uh, is the descendant, is the linguistic continuation of the uh, Britonic uh, language brought by the uh, newcomers and uh, you know Gaelic, Irish Gaelic is is the second one. Uh, so these people arrive. They have iron. Uh, they have horses, and they uh, immediately succeed in pushing the poor Picts uh, way to the north. But this, of course, is not the end of the story. Uh, as you all know, what happens next? Romans arrive, uh, and uh, in particular, build the Hadrian's Wall. Uh, to separate the settlements from the barbarians in the north. And the Hadrian's Wall must have been the prototype for the wall in Martin's book. <clears throat> Except that the real Hadrian's Wall is maybe just a couple of feet high. It's remarkably, uh, uh, it's, it's remarkably uh, small, in fact. Whereas the Martin's Wall is, uh, uh, or sh should we say was at this point in the story, uh, really, really tall. Anyway, uh, what happens another 400 years later is that yet another linguistic uh, ethnic group uh, moves into the Isles, and these are the Anglo-Saxons. So these are tribes that uh, used to uh, dwell in the north of Europe uh, and uh, modern-day Denmark, uh, and they uh, crossed the uh, sea and colonized uh, the British Isles. So if you look at the next slide, uh, uh, it's got this nice map with names of uh, these medieval uh, Anglo-Saxon and Celtic kingdoms. You can see that the names are different. So the, uh, uh, the names uh, of, of, of these territories uh, that are written in blue are Celtic, so Welsh, uh, Scottish, uh, Gaelic, uh, uh, places like Defed or Goddodin in the north. And of course, Essex and Sussex and Wessex are Anglo-Saxon or plain English names. So these uh, two ethnic groups uh, coexisted. And of course, in the course of history, uh, even though Anglo-Saxons adopted the name Britons for themselves, for their country, for the, country, for the island, uh, the indigenous Britonic population, <coughs> I apologize, uh, was pushed to the islands, such as Ireland, or to the north of the country. Uh, so continuous waves of uh, continuous influx of new 
uh, population. The history of the British Isles uh, is not the only inspiration that Martin uh, must have had. Uh, so uh, on the next slide, uh, I would like to introduce you, unless you already know, uh, to the wonderful series of books written by the French uh, author Maurice Druon, uh, uh, Le Roi Maudit, The Accursed Kings. Uh, uh, this is a seven volume series, uh, basically discussing the history of France uh, under the uh, dynasty of Capet <clears throat> until the Hundred uh, Years War. And this is exciting history uh, and very exciting books. They start with uh, the Iron King, uh, Philip IV of France, who burned the Knights of the Templar and disbanded, their, uh, uh, disbanded them. And George Martin himself has acknowledged, uh, you have a quote on the slide, that the series, uh, Drewon's Accursed Kings, has it all. There are kings and strangled queens and battles and betrayals and lies and lust, deception, family rivalries, cross of the Templars, babies switched at birth, and uh, what not. All of this is real history, very interesting history, and put uh, uh, in a very captivating way uh, by Maurice John. Uh, okay, enough about uh, real history and literary inspirations. Uh, I think the next thing we can do, we can usefully contrast uh, George Martin as the inventor of a fictional universe with uh, another uh, uh, important predecessor, uh, John Ronald Tolkien. The important difference between Martin and Tolkien uh, is that Tolkien, in fact, started with the language. So he was uh, effectively a professor of philology. Uh, philology means the study of uh, logos, that is word or language and literature. He spent all his career at Oxford. And the courses uh, he taught, uh, as you see on the slide, included such as Anglo-Saxon literature and language, Nordic mythology, so Nordic, uh, the term Nordic refers to basically the culture of the Vikings, uh, you know, tribes populate in modern day uh, Iceland and Norway and Denmark. Uh, and he also taught uh, the world of Celtic sagas. Uh, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about Cuchulain and uh, that wonderful mythology. Uh, finally, Tolkien also taught courses uh, on the Finnish uh, epic and uh, folklore. Um, Kalevala is the title. So that was the uh, world, the, uh, the world of medieval cultures and literatures that Tolkien inhabited uh, professionally. And uh, besides teaching these things, he actively uh, engaged in scholarship on them. So on this slide, uh, you can see that uh, his first um, uh, published monograph uh, was about Beowulf, uh, the old English epic poem that also features monsters and fighters uh, and swords. Uh, and uh, he also uh, edited some other texts, such as uh, this book about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And from here, it was a very uh, small step uh, for Tolkien to start creating uh, his own universe, uh, likewise populated by uh, um, fabulous creatures, uh, uh, chivalrous knights, and uh, uh, different um, ethnic groups. Uh, so what about languages in the case of Tolkien? Well, uh, uh, as I've just told you, he was fascinated with uh, Finnish uh, epic Kalevala, and as a result, uh, Sindarin, the Elvish language uh, in Tolkien, is uh, heavily based on Finnish language. And in Finnish, you have these long words, you have what is called uh, vowel harmony, so basically all vowels within a word uh, have similar characteristics, uh, either they're all front and high, like a, e, or they're back and low, like a, uh, o. Uh, so this is something that, uh, in Tolkien's mind, has uh, uh, lent uh, to Elvish language its melodic, uh, harmonious nature. Uh, there is a heavy admixture of Welsh. And again, uh, Tolkien professionally dealt with Celtic, and uh, draw, uh, he was able to draw on Welsh. Um, Sarah, something happened on my screen. Yes, we still have the slides. Perfect. And uh, Tolkien, uh, finally, of course, uh, was able to draw on Germanic languages, uh, old, old English, Old Norse, uh, the language of the Vikings, and uh, so on and so forth. Tolkien uh, is thus exactly uh, opposite of George 
Martin. George Martin uh, has himself, uh, uh, as you can see on the slide, admitted that he doesn't have a whole imaginary language in his desk, the way Tolkien did. So, of course, uh, Martin's strengths uh, lie elsewhere, uh, exciting plot, uh, strong characters, um, fascinating twists, but language uh, wasn't his thing. And there is very little by way of, uh, you know, fictional, invented, constructed language in uh, George Martin's books. Now, when the creators of this show, David Benioff, um, um, Dean Weiss, uh, uh, started working on the show, they decided that uh, it would be fantastic to have some actual languages uh, sounded out in the show. And this was, of course, the right move. And they had to hire somebody else uh, to devise these languages. So let me introduce you to the true creator of uh, Dothraki and Valyrian languages. His name is David Peterson. Uh, here on the slide, he's sitting on the Iron Throne, hopefully not cutting himself too much. Um, he, uh, uh, David Peterson is a linguist, so he got his BA in English and Linguistics from Berkeley, and then his MA, and he became interested in constructed languages early on. Uh, his interest, uh, as far as I know, goes back to his uh, taking an Esperanto class. So Esperanto is one of the oldest and uh, most widely spoken constructed languages. Uh, uh, the, this idea to you know, make up languages uh, is not limited to fiction and literature. Uh, of course, the origins of uh, constructed languages lie in um, uh, let's say, general uh, humanitarian attempts to, you know, unite the mankind by means of common language. And that's the idea uh, which led to creation of Esperanto and other languages. Anyway, uh, Peterson was very interested in making up languages. And uh, when the HBO commissioned uh, the contest uh, for fictional languages, he participated and won. Uh, so now uh, we know why it was necessary, uh, because Martin um, didn't invest too much of his uh, creative energy into uh, languages of his universe. Uh, and the next question is, uh, what could he uh, start with? What was the starting point for Peterson to create the language? Uh, as I think I've already said, there is very little uh, actual Valyrian or Dothraki in Martin's books. Essentially, one thing uh, Mar uh, Martin coined on his own is the phrase Valar Morgulis, which, as you all know, means uh, all men must die. And, uh, you know, let's face it, uh, with all due respect, uh, this is not a very inventive phrase. Uh, Morgulis uh, uh, is immediately identifiable as something related to death, because this uh, simply reeks of the English word morgue, right? Uh, so Martin took the word morgue and uh, added what looked like a, a pretty exotic ending and created this phrase. Uh, so this is what Peterson had. Uh, basically, he, whatever he invented uh, for Valyrian would have to comply, at least uh, with this phrase. Uh, and uh, what could he conclude by looking at Valar Margulis as a linguist? Uh, well, uh, it's immediately clear that Valar uh, must mean man. Uh, and uh, probably it's the same word as Valyria, the name of the continent or the island, uh, meaning land of man. Uh, so uh, as a null hypothesis, um, uh, Peterson could easily assume that the final R in Valar is the element that conveys the plurality, right? Uh, and that Morgulis is a verbal form that has something to do with the uh, uh, third person plural, they. So let's see where he uh, went from there. Uh, he, uh, see, the uh, task of constructing a language is not, uh, doesn't even start with the writing system, even though writing is what we uh, mostly associate with foreign languages. You know, when, you, when we think about learning Arabic or speaking Arabic, uh, first thing we think about is the calligraphy, or, you know, when we think about Chinese as a language, we visualize it uh, as uh, characters, Chinese characters in our head. But the fact is that writing is, uh, written language is secondary. So writing is a very important technology, but it's simply a means to uh, uh, convey uh, the spoken language, which is always primary. 
So yes, uh, both Tolkien and uh, Pedersen in his capacity as language creator had to uh, invent some writing systems, mostly inspired by runes, but this was not the first, but rather the last uh, step of the activity. Uh, what else uh, needs to be done? Well, you, uh, if you need a language, or obviously you need the words, uh, lexical words uh, referring uh, to actions and things and objects. And this is a reasonably easy task. So uh, all you need is a little bit of imagination. And uh, as we have seen, uh, Tolkien uh, was drawing on uh, Welsh vocabulary, on Finnish vocabulary, and was able to coin uh, new words this way. But what is essential is the grammar. And grammar, uh, I use the term here in a scientific and linguistic sense, right? Uh, grammar is a set of rules that the speakers use to uh, indicate relationship between words in their sentences and uh, uh, the rules that the speakers use to uh, uh, translate the idea uh, generated in their brains to uh, the actual utterance, linguistic utterance uh, uh, at the output. So let's uh, spend some time looking at actual high Valyrian. Uh, what options uh, uh, would a linguist creating high Valyrian language have uh, for what I just called grammar? Let's say uh, we've made up three words, three lexical roots. There is Vala, man. Remember, we decided that R uh, in Martin's phrase, Valar Margulis, is interpretable as a plural ending, like English S, you know, desk, desks. Uh, there's the word Garpa, meaning animal, completely made up. There's the verb Iprad, meaning to eat, completely made up. Now, if we want to make a sentence uh, like man eats animal, uh, what should be the linguistic means, or I should say the grammatical means, uh, by which these words are uh, strung together? One way of doing it is through syntax or word order. So as you see on the slide, uh, uh, hypothetically, uh, in a language like Valyrian, uh, you could have a phrase like vala garpa iprad, literally, man animal eats uh, whereas if you wanted to see to say something opposite uh, you know uh, with a more uh, sad outcome uh, the animal eats the man you would uh, again use the word order and reserve the first position in the sentence for the uh, acting uh, for the agent uh, meaning animal in this case so gerpa vala iprat would mean the reverse animal eats the man so that's uh, how syntax can be helpful uh, but uh, there's also what we call morphology, or the form of the of the words, uh, which is something else a language can use to uh, do the same job effectively, to indicate what kind of roles uh, words play in a sentence. So here um, is, uh, again, a hypothetical uh, morphological uh, invention. Uh, as you can see here, I've uh, changed the uh, ending on the word uh, uh, on the second word in the sentence. So from Gerpa, I went to Gerpe, and my sentence is now Vala Gerpe Iprat. So in my mini grammar that I'm just constructing here um, uh, with you, uh, A is the ending of the subject case, and E is the uh, ending of the object case. And this way, uh, you know, man, it's uh, fruit or animal is Vala Gerpe Iprat, whereas if uh, man is the object, uh, the word vala is changed into vale. And uh, notice that uh, when you're using morphology, uh, you can scramble uh, the order of the words because you're no longer using syntax, right? And uh, uh, no matter if you say vala gerpe or gerpe vala, you always know which word denotes the subject, which word denotes an object. I apologize, there is some uh, mistakes on this slide uh, uh, in the gloss of the word gerpe which I uh, said means animal, but then I translated as fruit. Not sure why. Um, now, let's talk a little bit more about grammar and morphology. Uh, this, uh, we just talked about uh, nominal uh, declensional endings, uh, but what about the verb? It's very helpful when a form of the verb uh, indicates through morphological means uh, whether this action is done by the speaker, by me, the first person, uh, by the interlocutor, so you, a second person, or by somebody else, third person. 
And uh, the way Pedersen uh, styled Valerian is that uh, the verbs, uh, the form of the verb, the morphology, is also helpful in uh, uh, rendering these uh, grammatical relationships. So uh, the phrase, uh, a man eats an animal in Valerian, would be vala, that's our subject case, gerpe, the e tells us it's the object, and then ipra das. And the as at the end is the conjugational ending uh, that tells us that uh, uh, the action is done by uh, somebody who is a third uh, person. Um, so again, uh, to go back to Valer Margulis, um, uh, DGP is Pedersen. Uh, he got this phrase from Martin. Uh, and uh, since Margulis, he knew, uh, meant uh, they must die. So this is third person plural. Uh, he had to build, uh, to uh, sort of develop a whole paradigm uh, of conjugation, uh, which you can see on the slide. So uh, if our sentence were, I, uh, as a man, eat an animal, uh, the form would be, of the verb would be morgulan. You eat an animal, morgula. Uh, he or she or it eats an animal, morgulas. And so on, and until we reach morgulis, which is a third person uh, plural meaning they. Um, what else did uh, Pedersen do with Valerian? Well, uh, besides creating cases uh, or endings uh, for uh, object and subject, uh, he uh, added quite a few other nominal cases. So you can see this table on the slide. Uh, uh, we usually use these uh, Latin uh, terms uh, when we talk about uh, morphological case systems in languages. So nominative is the case of the subject, as we have seen, this is vala. Uh, accusative is the case of the object, but, uh, you know, Martin threw in uh, quite a bit more. There is genitive, a special uh, form, morphological form that the word takes uh, when it denotes a possessor. So that's a genitive case. Dative is the form for the word that denotes somebody to whom something was given or done or made. Locative is the case of place. So uh, our word mala means man. Well, what would locative from man mean? In a man. Let's say in a man there is courage. Uh, if, if this is your sentence, you would use the locative case. Instrumental is, uh, well, case of instrument. So, you know, by a man, uh, something was done. Uh, commutative is a case form borrowed from uh, Finno-Ugric languages. Uh, uh, it means with alone with somebody. And finally, vocative is the form of address. Uh, this, is, this is how the morphology of uh, Valerian nouns uh, functions. And uh, you can see that um, English, of course, can express the same grammatical relationships. In English, you can, uh, 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 you can have phrases like, uh, uh, a heart of over man is brave. We don't have genitive case, but you can say over man. Or uh, you can say uh, the sword was given to a man. English doesn't have a dative case, but you can say you can use the preposition to, and so on and so forth. So one take home message here is that um, uh, all languages are capable of expressing uh, all possible content, but they're doing it in different ways. So English uh, in language doesn't have uh, rich morphology. Instead, English uses uh, uh, combines the nouns with a preposition. Other languages, such as Finnish, such as Latin, such as um, uh, Valyrian in this case, uh, do something else. They use a variety of uh, morphological endings uh, to indicate the same thing. Notice that in this table there are several columns. So uh, the first one is singular, the second one is plural. So if you need the plural men, uh, you, you get a whole other uh, set of endings for all the same cases, accusative, genitive, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, singular and plural are the categories uh, familiar from English. They're non-problematic. Uh, but look at the uh, columns three and four. Pogo, that's something really exotic. Well, exotic is a bad word for a linguist. We don't, we're not supposed to use it because we like all the languages. And as I just told you, all languages are ultimately capable of um, sending the same message across. But POCO number is something we find in uh, several languages. Uh, it means a few. So of course, in English, you have the lexical word few, and you can always say a few men, a few swords, 
uh, uh, or you can use the word like several. But in this language, in Valerian, it's part of morphology. If, uh, if you know for sure that there were many men, you use plural. If you know for sure there was one man, you use singular, bala. But if you know there were a few, but not too many, you use a whole uh, uh, other uh, form uh, with a U in there, Valun, uh, Valuni, and so on and so forth. And finally, there is a, a collective number, uh, which uh, presumably uh, Valerian uses uh, to refer to an uncountable uh, collection of something, right? Um, so um, something like, um, in English, you can say uh, three heads of cattle, that would be plural, right? Or you can just say cattle, uh, referring to several uh, animals, and this would be collective. Uh, here's an example of a vocative case, as it is used in the books. Uh, so the unsolid uh, are uh, dova ogedis, and this final s, we just saw it in the vocative uh, line, valus in singular, valis in plural, valusa in pocal. Uh, so this S tells you, uh, tells us that this is a special uh, form of address, right? So when uh, the Grey Worm uh, has to summon his soldiers, uh, he uses this form. And if you were talking, uh, if he had to create a sentence like the unsolid uh, uh, attack at dawn, uh, the form would be not dova ogedis, but rather dova e oge d without the s okay uh, well i hope you're still with me as we've uh, sort of uh, moved from uh, exciting history to more uh, specialized realms of uh, linguistics uh, let me uh, show to you a valerian phrase so that you could get a sense of uh, what this language does and how it's different from english uh, or other languages so this is the sentence that uh, denarius uses when uh, uh, she speaks to the merchants of Essos and tells them that she actually understands their language because she's a native speaker of Valyrian. Uh, she tells them she's the Daenerys stormborn of the house Targaryen of the blood of old Valyria. Valyrian is my mother tongue. So how does it work linguistically? Well, the first word is uh, nuke, uh, that's a pronoun meaning I, and then Daenerys is her name, uh, Jelmazmo. Jalmazmo uh, is an uh, abstract noun um, made from the word for wind, right? Uh, so uh, literally, Jalmazmo means something like windness, right? Uh, hen is a, a preposition, so this language still uses preposition. Uh, there is no such thing uh, in morphology that, you know, if you use case endings, you're not allowed to have preposition. No, language has all, uh, languages always have a certain amount of uh, redundancy built in uh, with them. Uh, then uh, Targario and Lentrot. Uh, Lentrot is a locative form. So she's hen Lentrot out of uh, house, right? Uh, so the uh, if you want to express something like out of, uh, you don't have a special uh, case form for it. You have to use the preposition hen. Uh, but notice that there are languages, for instance, spoken in Caucasus, where uh, you would have a special uh, different case form, even for something meaning out of. It would, uh, the case would be called something like ablative, right? And it would have a, its, its own designated uh, case endings, so you wouldn't need a, a preposition for it. And then uh, you have wepo, uh, blood. Uh, this uh, word stands in genitive case. Uh, because Daenerys is of the blood, right? Uh, so, in, again, in English, we don't have uh, really morphological cases, but you can always say, uh, uh, you can always use a construction with the preposition of, right? That does the same job as the genitive case does in Valyrian. All right, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, history of the language and uh, what we sometimes call social linguistics. That is the way uh, language uh, is used by uh, population. As you know, uh, in the show we have High Valyrian and Low Valyrian. High Valyrian is the dead language uh, for which uh, Targaryens are the only native speakers. Uh, well, Jon Snow doesn't speak uh, Valyrian, but you know his story. Uh, 
so nobody speaks it natively, but uh, the language still survived. Uh, it is used uh, throughout Essos and parts of Westeros as the language of learning and education. Uh, so if you be uh, belong to nobility, uh, you are going to uh, uh, study uh, High Valyrian. Whereas Low Valyrian is the uh, term, uh, is the name for a whole group, group of languages that descended from High Valyrian. So these are uh, local dialects of uh, these uh, cities in Essos, Astapor, Bravos, Mar, uh, and uh, the history as uh, Martin and then Patterson envisioned it is that uh, speakers of Valyrian uh, were, you know, spreading throughout um, uh, Essos and they were bringing their language along with them. And as they, uh, let's say, entered mixed marriages uh, or, you know, communicated with the locals, uh, their Valyrian speech uh, changed. So their language underwent a historic change and uh, uh, therefore, um, you know, the dialect of Astapor is not uh, identical with High Valyrian, right? Because several centuries uh, or even more like a thousand uh, uh, lie between the introduction of Valyrian on, on the continent of Essos and the emergence of this uh, mixed speech. Uh, here, the um, uh, inspiration of uh, Peterson uh, and Martin to an extent is pretty obvious. The model here must have been the Latin language. Uh, so Latin uh, is, uh, of course, became a dead language. Nobody spoke it natively uh, in early uh, Middle Ages. But as you all know, it persisted uh, throughout Middle Ages, and you can even say until now, as the language of uh, uh, literature, language of learning and education. Uh, Latin, of course, is uh, the state language of Vatican. Uh, even though nobody uh, speaks it natively. Uh, uh, there are um, a few TV channels uh, with news delivered in Latin uh, in various countries. Uh, so here is a dead language that still exists. At the same time, we have the um, low uh, version of Latin, the linguistic descendants of Latin, uh, being the Romance languages that are called Romance not because it sounds so romantic when you speak French or Italian, but because they evolved descended from the language of Romans. Uh, so what happened there is pretty well known. Uh, classical Latin uh, developed or linguistically evolved into what we call Vulgar Latin. This is not a pejorative term. Uh, vulgar uh, here means uh, of the common folk, right? And uh, what happened there is that Roman legionaries were stationed in different parts of Europe. And again, they entered mixed marriages with local population and they had to develop, uh, uh, you know, ways of communicating with the locals. And uh, therefore, uh, French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, these Romance languages are a result of further development of Latin language uh, in contact with uh, local languages of Europe. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Patterson uh, he, uh, paid equal attention uh, to uh, synchronic linguistics as he was creating, devising the grammars of these languages and to historical linguistics. So uh, he observed, uh, it's really clever, uh, uh, the uh, phrases from Bravo, Sio, Astapori, right, uh, use the same lexical roots as Valyrian, but every now and then you have uh, uh, little uh, changes in the sound or changes in morphology. So for instance, the verb to hear in Valyrian is uh, uh, zugagon and in Astapori it's zuhahon. Uh, so here's a change uh, uh, in the sound g, uh, when it's between two vowels, uh, it's now pronounced as g. And uh, this is exactly comparable to what happened uh, uh, let's say with Latin words like uh, uh, Latin caballus, the word for horse, uh, became the word, uh, the word uh, cheval, which means horse in French, and uh, is still uh, available in English in the word chivalry, right? Uh, uh, the quality associated with horse riders, the knights. Okay, let me finish. Uh, before we wrap up, let me say a few words about Dothraki. That's the other uh, big language um, created, devised for the show. It's the language of the nomads. Uh, this whole Dothraki culture uh, is inspired by nomadic cultures such as Scythians uh, or um, Mongols. Uh, and uh, their language is something uh, Patterson had to work out on his own. 
Uh, and uh, let me just point out a few fascinating things about this language. For instance, it doesn't have the verb to have. Uh, the verb to have is pretty important. So all languages need to indicate a possession in some case. You know, I have a book. Uh, so what uh, Dothraki does here, uh, it uses a phrase literally meaning in hand. So if you want to have to say, uh, I have an Arak, you say Arak Mrak Ora, and uh, this literally means Arak is in someone's, uh, in my hand, right? So uh, what happened here is that uh, uh, the word for hand became, as we linguists say, grammaticalized. So uh, the lexical word meaning hand is now used to indicate the grammatical relationship of possession. That's how a lexical word becomes a grammatical marker. And that's what happens in languages uh, all the time. So uh, languages develop new uh, conjugational endings, new declensional endings out of uh, what used to be former lexical words. So one example uh, from English would be the future tense. So obviously in a sentence like, I'll go to class, uh, the L, which is a contraction of will, uh, is a grammatical marker. Uh, that's the way you form uh, future tense in English. But if you go a few centuries back, eight or nine centuries back, you will see that willon in Old English, let's say in Beowulf, the epic poem we mentioned, is used as a lexical verb, meaning to want something. Uh, so let's say I want a sword or I want to go to battle. Uh, these would be sentences you, uh, formed with the verb will on. And uh, well, of course, in a sentence, I'll go to class, uh, no actual desire uh, is often involved. So this is grammaticalization. Uh, another fact about Dothraki, which I um, admire, is that uh, uh, the horses and the act of riding horses uh, is so important for this culture uh, that it also permeates uh, the language itself. So uh, basically the Dothraki uh, use the verb meaning to ride uh, in meanings uh, that go well beyond its proper lexical meaning, to ride a horse. So when you say, uh, when you ask how are you, you literally ask do you ride well? Or when you say I am from the city, I've grown up in the city, you say I ride from the city, right? Uh, and even uh, when you, uh, in the Thraki, when you want to uh, uh, talk about the action you are about to undertake, you can still use the same verb in a grammaticalized meaning. Uh, so I write to eating would be something, uh, would be a way of saying I'm about to eat. Okay? So uh, a few uh, concluding thoughts. Um, what, uh, what does making a language entail, right? Uh, I hope from these few uh, examples I've given you, it uh, uh, becomes clear that language is much more than a lexicon, just much more than a dictionary, a collection of words. It also has grammar. And grammar is really important. Uh, 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 besides morphology and syntax, uh, it includes, um, uh, you know, the term grammar uh, includes uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and one, uh, important feature of grammar that I wanted to mention is called language universals. Uh, so one uh, staggering thing about langu human language is that uh, these grammatical rules, uh, uh, they don't exist randomly. It's often the case that if there is uh, a certain grammatical rule uh, or a you know, property or a feature of a language, uh, it's uh, going to mean that you are going to find uh, another unrelated rule possibly in another domain. Let me give you an example uh, of such an implicational universal. Uh, let's say uh, if you speak a human language and your language has sounds like v and z, uh, so these are voiced fricatives, uh, it is uh, going to be the case without any exception that your language is also going to have sounds f and s. The reverse isn't going to be true. There are plenty of languages that have sounds f and s, s, but don't have v and z. So this is uh, an example of an implicational universal where one grammatical fact implies uh, another grammatical fact. And as you can see, there is more to grammar than an uh, untrained eye can see. There are more examples of universals uh, on the slide. Uh, uh, there are universals of syntax, uh, uh, which is the word order. Uh, but the, the curious uh, 
um, the curious uh, fact I wanted to mention is that uh, all of these universals that linguists have discovered, they obviously uh, concern uh, human languages. So uh, to name another example of a constructed language, Klingon, uh, you see that uh, uh, the creators of Klingon uh, had to do a very clever thing. They had to violate precisely these universals, the core properties of uh, language. And, uh, you know, Klingon is a whole other topic, but uh, the creators of Klingon have done it extremely well. So there, uh, there are uh, more than 7,000 languages spoken on our planet, and not a single one is like Klingon. So Klingon violates uh, uh, some very fundamental thing about uh, human language, uh, which I think is uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, this is not the case with, uh, this wasn't the task uh, for Pedersen uh, as he was devising uh, Valyrian or Dothraki. These are more or less human languages uh, because the world of Martin's saga uh, is a human world. Uh, but nonetheless, I thought I would put it on your uh, raiders. Well, uh, let me show you the map one last time. And now I'm happy to take questions uh, if you have any. Sarah? Yes, thank you so much. Um, so, alums, please type your questions in. I see we have one that's working its way onto the screen here. Um, and I have to just say, first of all, thank you so much, Sasha, for your presentation. Perhaps I'm not a proper Game of Thrones fan, but I had no idea how detailed these languages were, from the grammar to the different forms of the words. Um, it's amazing. Right. Uh <laughs> Sarah, I'm really glad you brought this up. Detailed is the keyword here. Yeah. You know, uh, creating a language is basically a, a binary thing. Either you create the entire language because there are these things called universals and you have to think about every little part of your morphology, your phonology, your syntax, uh, or you just create a few words and that's a bad job. So Nicole has posted a question here for us. Are there any other language examples like the Dothraki ride well? Yes, Nicole, that's an excellent question. And uh, so if you look up grammaticalization, that's a very hot field and you'll be able to find a lot of materials. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, indigenous languages of Amazon Valley, uh, there are several groups of them, they're um, possibly unrelated, but they all use uh, swim in the same meanings. So swim uh, from a lexical uh, verb denoting movement in the water be uh, became the default uh, almost grammaticalized verb uh, to denote uh, all sorts of motion and even lack thereof. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, I mean, grammaticalization is all around us. Um, uh, to give you another example, I'm sure you know some of you uh, uh, speak uh, some French, right? So how do we, how do we make the uh, French? Uh, how do we make the future tense in, Fran in French uh, with the suffix "ere" like "chanterre"? Uh, but uh, we know uh, when we study French texts, when we go back in time, we look at old French, uh, uh, like 13th century, 12th century. We know that this. Uh, uh, Future tense has developed from a combination of the uh, uh, verbal root meaning, uh, in my example, to sing, chante, uh, with an auxiliary verb uh, meaning to have, uh, the avoir of French, right? And then uh, uh, the uh, lexical verb and the auxiliary verb merge together. And as a result, a few centuries later, you have a single grammatical form with a morphological suffix. And when somebody, uh, you know, teaches French uh, to, let's say, speakers of English, uh, nobody tells them that, uh, you know, the, these used to be uh, two different words uh, in, in the French future and then they merged. You don't need this information. This is diacrony. This is the th thing of the past. Uh, instead, you just uh, teach uh, French future as, uh, uh, as a suffix. Uh, and of course, right now, in modern French, uh, something completely different is going on. Uh, a different auxiliary verb uh, along uh, allez, uh, is now used, uh, and uh, this shows us that uh, language history goes in cycles. So grammaticalization is a process uh, through which um, uh, you know languages can go uh, uh, several times. Okay, now I see example from uh, I, I see a question from David. What are some other languages that have a rich morphology like Valyrian? 
Excellent question. So uh, uh, morphology can be nominal or verbal. So we've talked about noun declensions. We've talked, uh, we have very talked about verbs. Uh, but okay, let me tell you, uh, for nouns, let me send you to the Finno-Ugric language family. So a language like Hungarian. Uh, it's of course spoken in the middle of Europe, but it's immediately related to uh, Finnish and Estonian in the north of Europe. Uh, so those languages have uh, upwards of 14 different cases. Again, the same idea. Instead of using the combination, uh, instead of using the combination of a preposition and the, and the noun, uh, you have a, a special uh, designated uh, case ending. Uh, and if you go to Caucasus, the uh, uh, Caucasus Mountains, that region is a wonderful uh, uh, melting pot of uh, uh, languages, and uh, there is a lot of uh, quote-unquote exotic uh, features there. So some uh, languages, such as uh, Ubuk or uh, Dagestani languages, uh, have upwards of 30 cases. So there you go. And uh, I just wanted to mention really quick, I did put that Q&A box up there in case anyone wants to submit their question anonymously. So you have two options. You can put it in the presenter chat, which everyone can see, or in the Q&A box. Um, and then go ahead, Sasha, there's a question there from Leanne. Okay, and Leanne is asking if there are properties uh, that people thought were universal, but the counterexample was found. This is such a good question. Uh, let me think a little bit. Uh, well, the answer is yes, emphatically yes, thousand times yes, because uh, the thing is, um, as I mentioned, there are upwards of uh, 7,000 languages spoken on the planet, and not even half of them are well described. So there are languages uh, uh, in, I don't know, places like Papua New Guinea, uh, who are still waiting for a linguist to come along to do field work and to write a grammar. And uh, when a new grammar of a previously undescribed language is published, uh, then ling linguists who are interested in typology, you know, rush to get this book and they look for precisely this, counterexamples to what they thought was, was universal rule. Uh, let me tell you another story. Uh, there's a language that was only recently described, again spoken in the Amazon Valley. The name is uh, uh, Piranha, uh, Piranha. Uh, you, you, piranha, you know the uh, name of the fish, of course, right? And uh, uh, when a book about this language was published a decade ago, the author claimed that, uh, hey, here's this language I described, it violates uh, what you guys thought were, were core properties of human language. Uh, it had to do with uh, recursion, uh, so we think that uh, we think that what every human language can do is to uh, uh, encapsulate one clause into another clause. So like uh, my professor said that uh, his friend told him that uh, his mom taught him that blah, 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 right? So every human language was thought to be, uh, to have a capacity of nesting these clauses uh, in one another. Uh, and uh, these and other features were claimed to be not true uh, and not found in, the, in that Piranha language. Well, uh, what happened is that several teams of linguists uh, uh, buckled up and went down there and did their field work and were able to prove that uh, no, Pirani is not an exception. Uh, it does all the same tricks. It follows all the same rules as uh, other human languages. So I hope this answers the question. Um, here's a question from Zach. Uh, is everyone in Westeros and Iron Island supposed to be speaking? Uh, I'm sorry, I have... Mm. But everyone seems to be able to understand one another. Uh, huh. Right, that's a good question. So, um, uh, well, Iron Islands, uh, I'm, I'm not such a diehard fan of the show to remember the details, but, uh, you know, the inhabitants of Iron Islands uh, settled them probably just a few hundred years ago, and they've been in constant contact with the Westeros, so their language must be more or less the same uh, as the, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, Westeros language, uh, basically think uh, think of it as uh, British English and American English, right? The British brought uh, the language to North America, and uh, now there are a few differences between two dialects, but we don't, uh, uh, there's really no uh, big problem uh, understanding the Brits, right? Uh, and uh, of course, the contact between uh, language communities helps, 
which is the reason why, uh, yeah, the, uh, so be, because the uh, inhabitants of Iron Islands uh, continued, you know, raiding uh, Westeros towns and uh, coming to Westeros, uh, the, um, their language didn't develop in isolation. Uh, so what what's more interesting is uh, I'm, uh, even when I when I read the books I wasn't always certain uh, what language uh, do they speak uh, in uh, Essos right and uh, remember uh, well Daenerys uh, has uh, Missande as a translator whom she doesn't really need um, uh, but I think the assumption is that as, as soon as uh, even Westerosi people uh, come to Essos, uh, they uh, try to speak the local language um, in the same way as, um, you know, uh, British uh, uh, merchants uh, come into um, uh, the Caribbeans a few centuries ago would uh, uh, switch to broken Spanish, right? Uh, so we have to assume that uh, uh, people uh, made an effort uh, to learn the languages of uh, one another, as has always been the case in human history anyway. But ultimately, uh, I'm sorry if this is confusing, but ultimately I think Zach is right. Uh, 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 th there's there's uh, the language difference in show and in the books is sort of glossed over, right? And uh, sometimes uh, uh, we are not even told about uh, uh, communication difficulties that may have arisen. We have a few minutes left if anyone has another question. Um, I know I'm curious, did you look up the information about the languages somewhere or did you watch the shows and sort of take note of some of those key phrases and then use your linguistic background to break them down? I, well, thanks for asking this. Uh, I think you, you think too highly of me. Uh, I didn't just extract all of this from the show. Uh, I use the uh, fan uh, device websites, right? But, you know, sometimes when I, as a trained linguist, when I go to these uh, websites where people who really know their show and really know their books, uh, when these people try to uh, write down the rules, I can see where they've gone wrong, right? Uh, and um, I, I haven't had the time to, you know, write to them and correct their analysis. Uh, but uh, basically, one could make a great problem set out of this, uh, out of, uh, you know, trying to figure out what the rest of the grammar should look like based on individual examples. Uh, the fact is we simply don't have enough Valyrian or enough Dothraki in the books or in the show uh, to uh, confirm uh, every possible assumption about what their grammar is, right? Uh, uh, and um, that remains a problem. Well, and I do, I believe that there are people who have learned Klingon and, and do speak it. I don't know if you know on any of these websites if there are people who try to oh, learn these languages and speak them or how the actors learn to speak them. That's different. Uh, so uh, for Klingon, its creators uh, actually went at great lengths uh, to publish uh, dictionaries and update dictionaries. And, uh, you know, the show uh, Star Trek is pretty long and uh, there's much more language in there. Right, uh, so uh, uh, Klingon uh, is uh, actually pretty well known, right? So you can, uh, I think there have been even people, you know, diehard fans uh, who spoke only Klingon to their child. And of course the uh, uh, poor person has grown up uh, as a native speaker of Klingon and English was their uh, second language. Uh, I don't know what happened to them later in life, but uh, uh, this is, possible, right? So uh, we know Klingon well enough uh, to, uh, uh, you know, do experiments of this sort. Uh, with uh, Tolkien's languages, uh, again, Tolkien being a language guy, uh, he uh, continued sort of updating his languages until his, er uh, his, his death, right? Uh, and there is also, uh, there's plenty of material for the fans. Uh, with with uh, Game of Thrones, there just isn't enough material, so fans trying to uh, uh, write these grammars have to um, make educated or less educated guesses, right? Uh, and um, this is uh, interesting to observe. But I don't. I, I think time has yet to come when uh, people design enough of, uh, let's say, Valyrian uh, for it to be able to actually use as a language of communication. 
thank you. And we have uh, actually maybe 30 seconds left, but we have one more question from Allison. Can you see that there, Sasha? She's asking I, about some grammatical rules. Uh, can you read it out for me? Yes. She says, I know you mentioned how grammatical rules governed. Oh, I actually can't read the whole thing. Let me just. Conjugations and informed much of these. Okay, that's, that's good. No, that's a different chat. Yeah, I'm just going to. It's a little tricky here. I'm going to make this bigger so we can read the question. I know okay. you mentioned how grammatical rules governed conjugations and informed much of these languages, but how would Peterson or other language creators? just uh, by, by just using the fancy. So again, uh, I'm sorry if I talk too much about Tolkien, but uh, as you probably know, the entire Middle Earth started with one word, and the word was Hobbit. Tolkien sat down and wrote a sentence that I had in the slides, once upon a time there lived a Hobbit, right? And uh, nobody knows the etymology of Hobbit. So uh, basically making up words is uh, uh, a fascinating game uh, for which you just need fantasy and a bit of a common sense. Wonderful. Um, fantasy and a bit of common sense. I think that is a good <laughs> note to end on. Um, I may have revealed uh, my lack of knowledge about Klingon and Dothraki, but I do love grammar. So I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm sure all of our alums did as well. I don't know if there's any, any last words you want to share before we sign off. Well, I encourage everyone to uh, read books about linguistics. Uh, I encourage everyone uh, uh, to read books about history. And uh, this is cool stuff. It's very cool. Thank you again for taking time. Um, Professor Nikolaev, we really appreciate your expertise. And to all the alums out there, thank you for participating. Thank you for your questions. We do have another educational webinar coming up later this month. I will tell you really quickly. It's on November 28th with Professor Amy Baltzell. She's a professor in the School of Education, and she will talk about mindfulness and performance. She works with um, sports psychology, but she is going to talk about mindfulness um, that you can apply to your, your whole life, not just your sporting life. So if you'd like to register, go to bu.edu slash alumni slash events. And we hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.